Well, we're glad you are here tonight. We're going to continue our study in the book of Psalms, and we're going to be in Psalms chapter 39. And you might uh, also, while we're doing that, you might go ahead and uh, put a, a finger or something into uh, Philippians chapter 4, because we're going to be uh, looking at both of those passages. Uh, I want us to have a word of prayer, if I may. I'm going to read part of this psalm, and then we're going to pray. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle, while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow is stirred, was stirred. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know thine end, and measure my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, thanking you for your word. And God, what a precious thing it is to us in our lives. And God, all of us as human beings are filled with frailties of this life. And Lord, we struggle with this life and the issues that we face in this life. And sometimes with our day-to-day -day living. But God, we know that you give us wisdom in the time of trouble. And so, Father, help us to see your wisdom, to follow your ways, to delight in your law, that it may all be well with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of the language you see here in Psalm chapter 39, you also saw in Psalm chapter 38. I have listed this psalm as a psalm of wisdom in the middle of trouble. And it's interesting when you look at a lot of the language that is spoken here is similar to that which was spoken in 38. There again, in all of my studies, and I read after several very learned people in this psalm, and I came away from it like I did in Psalm chapter 38. I'm not on board with their, uh, their concept and totality of it. And so I think that this is a different approach than many have taken. I'm not saying that I'm right, and certainly I don't have the credentials behind my name to say that I'm right, but I do believe that there is a uh, prism here, if you might, like looking into a diamond where the reflection of God is seen in it. And that reflection to me is a different reflection than the one that they have seen. This word uh, who it is addressed to was a person who was of the Levite family of the Makari family. And they had uh, been listed in Chronicles and other places throughout the scriptures as the uh, ones who were part of leading the worship service for the people of God. Remember that this is a song book, and so these are songs that were sung uh, in honor of God. And it's addressed to Yadayana, and that is the person who David has given this song to. And actually the name uh, Yadayana is means praising. And so when I start thinking about praising and worship, then I take a different reflection on what it is that God is trying to say to us. In the first three verses that I just read here, one of the things that sticks out to me, he said, I will take heed to my way that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mind, mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. And you know, one of the things that I have 
witnessed in my own life is knowing when to speak and when not to speak. Taking a deep breath, if you will, and sometimes the most appropriate and loving thing that we can do as a child of God is to say nothing. Is to just say nothing. The, the psalmist says here, I was hot in my mouth. I was ready to go after it, is what he was saying. I wanted to give these people a piece of my mind. But holding your tongue, when everything in us cries out for justice, is a difficult proposition. And I don't think we can do that in our own strength. I'll be honest with you. I think that, you know, as we learn in James, that the, that the tongue is a world of fire, of iniquity. The tongue, you know, the, 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 you know no man can control it. And so we need the hand of the Lord to get us through. We need the hand of the Lord on our mouths because we have a tendency to offend. I have done it over and over and over again in my ministry unintentionally. I have said something that hurt somebody's feelings because that was not my intent, but that's the way it turned out. I said something that I thought was being truthful, but being truthful does not mean being hurtful. And so we have to be careful with the words that we use. I'm reminded of what my grandmama used to always say, and I may have said this last week. She said this, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. When a person has made up their mind about you, and they have decided, as the wicked will do, to attack you, there is little that you're going to be able to say or do that's going to change that environment. Isn't it amazing that psychologists tell us that when we meet a new person, within a few seconds we have made up our mind about who that person is, irregardless of whatever else is going on? People choose to believe about you whatever that is that they are going to believe, and really there is little that you can do to change that. Even when we try to give evidence to the other side, most of the time, in my experience, that has not been well received. So the psalmist says something very important here. He says, I am going to not give them any information or any ammunition to fire more darts at because their ideas about who I am are not anything like what God's ideas are about me. People tend to mix up evidence and they try to build their evidence to fit their own conclusions, whatever they may be. I heard a preacher say one time, and thankfully that's never been an issue with my own ministry in life, but he said, you know, he was talking to me privately, he said, you know, there's a couple of charges that people bring against you that you cannot respond to. Any way you go, people are going to believe whatever they're going to be. If somebody accuses you of having an illicit affair, if you rise up and try to defend yourself in that, they're going to say he must be guilty because look how hard he's fighting against it. If he says nothing about it and just lets it pass, then they're going to say, well, he must be guilty or he'd fight against it. So there are some things that you just can't win in when it comes to how people feel and what people think. Look, if you will, please, be in, with me in Philippians chapter 4. And I want to read some verses there uh, that uh, the, that has been written there. In Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. What does that moderation mean? It means be equal in your life, right? 
have an equal spirit, have a loving spirit. So he's saying that the Lord is at hand. The Lord is going to take care of you. You don't have to defend yourself. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand, he says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So he lays out about three different things here that you and I need to pay attention to. Firstly, he reminds us that the Lord has got the, all of the information and there won't be any misjudgments on the part of the Lord. But he says, when you are up against it, there's a couple of things you need to do. First of all, you need to speak to the Lord about it, don't you? You need to bathe the matter in prayer before God. You need to spend some time in communication with the Lord to make sure that everything is right as best as it can be in your own heart. Do not let those who attack you drag you to their level by going down to where they are to act as they do. Then it says supplication. Now supplication is asking the Lord for His will to be done in your life. Whatever that may be. And then lastly, thanksgiving. Have a thankful heart. There are things in our lives that happen that do not make us very thankful, <laughs> to tell you the truth. There are some things in our lives that happen that really go right down to where we live. And it's difficult there. And so the psalmist is talking about this kind of condition that's going on. He is not in a position, as many of the writers that I have read, are in a, in a position where he is in a position where he's in a bad way with the Lord. I think it's just the opposite. I think he's in a good way with the Lord, and that's why he's addressing the issue. Though. And the case in point, if you look at verses 4 through 7, as we read them, he says, The Lord... Make me to, uh, to know my end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and my age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best stated is altogether vanity, said I. So what is he saying here? He's saying the wisdom of God is what you and I need. We need to know how we need to behave ourselves when things are not going well. That we don't go to the level of those who are attacking us. That we don't go to the level of those people who are ignorant of God's providence in their life. Who care not about those things. Turning to God when the pressure is on us, and that pressure a lot of times is from within. Has anybody ever said anything hateful to you and you just wanted to go back at them? And you wanted to get it? You wanted to get it on, so to speak? Even sometimes in our own spirit, in our own mind, when we take the wisdom of the Lord and we don't respond, we're still eat up inside with it, aren't we? We internalize it. And folks, that is a very dangerous place to be. It's not a healthy place. We have to be able to do something about what it is that God wants in our life. We have to know our limitations. And then knowing our limitations, we have to place our limitations into the hand of God. That's what David's talking about right here. And right here in this verse of Scripture. Our life then compared to eternity. He said, hand, breath, let me know my end. All the things in the measurement of his life, right? Our life here is compared to eternity. It's like a whisper. And what did James say there? It, what is your life, Right? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. It's a breath. That's what it is. You are one 
breath away from eternity. And you have no guarantee at all of the next breath except by the grace of God and the loving hand of God. Now, I don't know when my last breath is going to come, but I suspect it will, <laughs> and so will yours. And what is significant is not that last breath that we take here, but the first breath we take there. That's the one that matters, isn't it? Troubles that you and I face in this life pass with this life. We don't take them to the other side. Aren't you glad? The people who hate you here, if they make it there, they won't be able to hate you there either. They'll have to leave it here. And so our troubles and our pains and our sorrows and our miscalculations and all of those things we tend to internalize that drive us away from God, all of those things are going to get left here. And since they're not going to go with us there, why not leave them here now? Why carry them now? We carry them now because we feed our own emotions with that. And that's an unhealthy position, I think. Eternity is forever. Now notice he uses the word Selah. And that word Selah here means pause. Remember we've always talked about it in a musical connotation. It means to stop, think, reflect. One of the biggest problems that we have, I believe, as the children of God, and in my own life I know that is, is sitting down long enough to think through the problems and to pray and to get our supplication before God and to become thankful before God for all that is doing all of those things we talked about in Philippians chapter 4 a while ago, all of those kind of things in place. And by the way, that takes time. We have to wait, don't we? And none of us like to wait. We like to move on. We want to get this pigeonhole out of the way, done then move on, right? Sometimes that's not the way it works, so is it? Sometimes we have to wait on God. Sometimes we have to seek out His wisdom. Sometimes that takes time. We have to think about life, then, in a proper perspective. And we're never going to do that unless we spend time with God. Because God doesn't see the problems that you and I face through the same lenses that you and I see. He sees them in a different way and in a different light. We see them as wondering what the end is going to look like. God sees them and says, I know what the end looks like. I've got it all taken care of. This is all a part of my plan. My computer crashed, as I told you earlier this evening. Don and I was talking about that today. And I said, you know, I don't know how that's going to turn out. This is certainly stressful. But you know what? God knew it was going to crash six hours before it was supposed to be downloaded onto a hard drive, long before I knew it. And he allowed it to happen. So there has to be a reason. And when it all is said and done, God is going to bring a victory through it all because he is going to, he's going to handle it. Am I stressing about it? I'm a human being. You better believe it. But I also know that God is going to take it through and God is going to do something. It's kind of like with the COVID hit. We never dreamed in this church about ever live streaming or having uh, a YouTube a web page or any of that. That was not in our thought pattern at all. But now, as a result of this terrible time we're going through, we have all of that that God has allowed to happen as a result of this other thing that has happened. So, sometimes we don't get it, but we trust God in it, and God takes care of it. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. The wisdom of God it is not what we have 
that matters before God, it is who we have that matters. It's not what you have that matters, it's who you have that matters. And who is it that you have, the child of God? You have Jesus, right? You have the Holy Spirit, right? You have all of those things going on as a help, as a strength to you, as a deliverance to you, if you will. Then I want us to look back again at Philippians chapter 4. And I want us to look at verses 10 through 13. And these are passages that I'm sure you're familiar with. But what does it say? But, in number 10, he said, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care for me hath flourished again for in you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of what, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know how to be obeyed, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Boy, that's a lot, isn't it? Think about that. Pause on that. Reflect on that a while. And then how does he end that? Look at verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Jesus is our dear kinsman and Ruth would say redeemer. He has redeemed us. He has given us what we need. He is our deliverer. Look, if you will, please, and what he says now in verse number uh, 6. Every man walketh in a vain shoe. Surely they are disquieted in vain. And he heapeth of riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what I wait, I wait for. My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions and make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was done. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. What does he say? I kept my mouth quiet. Right? In the midst of all this, I didn't say a word. Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thy hand. When thou with rebukest, dost correct a man for iniquity, thou makest the beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity to lie. What is he saying here? You remember last week we talked about this is, the, this is the word of deliverance, first of all. Remember last week we talked about the word chastisement? Do you remember what we said chastisement was from, verse, from chapter 38? We said that chastisement means instruction, training, nurturing, education, or tutoring. It's building up. As Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 8 says. So the psalmist is not crying out to God in anguish about some sin in his life. What he's doing is he's saying that God, you are my deliverer. In verse 39, he says, I, uh, in, in verse number uh, 9, he says, I will submit myself to you. Because thou did. He uses some words here, talking about in verse 8, he says, deliver me from all my transgressions. What does transgressions mean? Transgressions is rebellion. Now listen, rebellion, hear me, rebellion is always intentional. Always. Never by accident. It's always intentional. 
So what do we have to do? We have to submit ourselves to the authority of God so that we do not find ourselves in a place of rebellion against God. Sometimes when God is training us and maturing in a, us and nurturing us, we misunderstand the import and the importance of it and what God is trying to do in our lives because we are short-sighted. Right? God doesn't do things to us to hurt us. God builds us up. He's our deliverer. The psalmist knew that. He recognized God's loving kindness. And we would not be able to stand against his wisdom and power any more than the psalmist could. He has placed us, remember this in the New Testament, he has placed us in his Father's hand. Right? Wrap us up in the Father's hand sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Nothing can, can penetrate that veil that God has prepared for you and me. Have you ever rebelled against God? <laughs> you ever found that to be a really good deal? No. Never have. So David says, I have to be delivered, right? So that I don't rebel against God. So that I see God's plan. So that I see God's training. So that I see God's tutorials in my life. So that I might grow. I see the loving kindness in that hand of God to keep me out of harm's way, not to take me into it. Then he uses another word. Here he uses the word iniquity. He uses the word iniquity in verse number 11. And what does he mean by that? He's talking about moral <coughs> faults. Doing those things morally that are wrong. Being mischievous and carrying the guilt of sin. Sometimes we unintentionally get into sin, don't we? We let our guard down. We forget the power of God. We do not listen to the Holy Spirit. We do not do those things that we've been trained to do. And every time when we do that, it always is a disaster. And so the psalmist is saying, don't let me do that. I need your hand to protect me. And there again he uses the word vanity just before the pause. And what does he mean by vanity? He does not mean, let me correct you with this, he does not mean worthlessness. That is not what he means. What the preacher says in Ecclesiastes is, vanity of vanities, right? What he's talking about is emptiness. He's talking about doing those things that are unprofitable that bring emptiness in our life. And he's talking about, again, that theme of vapor and breath in vanity. Every breath that you and I take in this life is by the generous, loving, kind spirit of our loving Lord who gave us the breath that we have and sustained us with the breath that we have and gives us the breath that we breathe. Right? Think about that. So he said, pause. Think about this. Think about the deliverance of the Lord. Think about what God is going to do for you in your life. In verses 12 and 13, he ends with a prayer again, doesn't he? He says, hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not thy peace from my tears and my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as my fathers were. O spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and 
be no more. Again, this is not a song of desperation, but rather a song of acquittal. And what the psalmist is saying is, this world is not my home. I've just passed it through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen? This world is not my home. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a soldier. In the old covenant, they were pilgrims. They were nomadic people. They were moving from one place to the other until the Lord brought them into their own land. They were pilgrims. They were sojourners. Listen, this world is not our home. Heaven is our home with Jesus. And I don't know about you, but the sooner we get there, the better we'll be. And that is not a fatalistic statement either. That's a statement of reality. As the psalmist says, he's not, he says, oh, spare me that I may recover strength. What's he saying? I need your strength, Lord. I need to walk in your strength. I need to walk in your peace. I need to walk in your ways before I leave this place. Why? For testimony's sake. I need to be what I should be before you. God, help me to do that. So when we look at Psalms 39, I see the provisional part of the Lord in delivering us from the curse of this life and the curses of this life by His own strength and His own power. But that only happens when we live in His wisdom. If we try to get it somewhere else, it won't work. We need His wisdom. We need His hand. We need His direction. We need His training. We need His love. We need His surrounding power in our lives. Otherwise, we come to the end of our life as a vapor that appears for a little time vanishes away with no import or impact at all to the glory of God. Father, we come before you thanking you for your word. God, I pray that you may just empower it tonight. Lord, you tried to give me some thoughts and I tried to put them down on paper and then express them. God, I am not foolish. I know that if there's anything that comes out of this, it will be because of the power of the Holy Spirit and not because of my intellect, strength, or anything else. It will be through your hand and through your power. And so I submit all this into your hand. And God, I pray that you take and use it as it pleases you to help your children. God, we want to minister. We want to be a servant. We want to help. So God, help us through the songs to deliver your word and righteousness and kindness and in love so that we might see your great love for us in Jesus.